The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, welcome back. So last week, we spent the week um, talking about policy search methods and trying to um, make a distinction between those and the value-based methods we started with. And by the end of the week, we had a couple um, pretty slick methods for optimizing an open loop trajectory of the system. Right? So we talked about at least two ways. Right, so by open loop, I mean it's a function of time, not a function of state. We talked about the shooting methods. Right, where we um, evaluated J of alpha from x0 times 0 just by simulation. Right? And we evaluated, explicitly evaluated the gradients um, by, well, I gave you two algorithms for it. I gave you one that I called backprop through time, which was an adjoint method, and another one that I called RTRL, real time recurrent learning, which are the names from the neural network community, but um, perfectly good names for those methods. And then the claim was that if we can compute those two things by simulation or, or some combination, so simula forward simulation and then a back propagation path, pass, or a simulation which carried also the derivatives forward in time, then we could hand those gradients to SNOPT or some other um, nonlinear optimization package. And if we're good, we can also lean on SNOPT to handle things like final value constraints. If you want to make sure the trajectory succeeds in getting you exactly to the goal, or if you want to make sure that your torques are never bigger than some maximum torque allowed, then you can take advantage of that. And the second method, remember, was a direct co-location method, which we often abbreviate as Dirkhal. And the big idea there was to um, over-parameterize our optimization with the open loop trajectory but also the state trajectory which makes coming up with gradients is simple um, and then I have to enforce the constraint that x of, let's say in discrete time here, n plus 1 had better be um, subject to the dynamics. So two very similar um, methods of of trying to compute some open loop trajectory um, as a function of time. Ultimately, what I care about is a, is a, is a set of um, actions that I apply over time that will um, get me to the goal or, or minimize my cost function. In the case where I explicitly parameterize an open loop trajectory, um, both of these result in a solution which satisfies the Pontryagin minimum principle. Okay? 
subject to discretization errors and things like that. So, right, so so I should say subject to time discretization. That's the the one place where technically it would satisfy a discrete time version of Pontryagin's minimum principle. So that thing where you have to You can think of it either, whichever way it makes you uh, happier. So in fact, um, the parameters that you hand in, maybe it's easier to think of it as a, as a, a function, a discrete function of time, because you're going to hand it u at certain points in time. And you're going to handle x at, hand it x at certain points in time. right? And this discrete time update can be an Euler integration or a, or a higher order integration of your continuous dynamics. But you only satisfy the constraints at discrete intervals of time. Yeah. OK, I did um, give you a slightly more general. I tried to, to point out that these methods could equally well um, compute, um, find good parameters of a feedback controller or something, too. Right? The simple case was when my parameters alpha were explicitly my control tape. but. More generally, if you wanted to tune a, a feedback controller, a linear feedback controller, or a nonlinear feedback controller, or a neural network, or whatever it is, you can use the same methods to do that. Um, I would only make this statement in the case where the, the um, controller specifically is the open loop tape, right? Um, because if I parameterize my trajectory by some feedback controller, for instance, then that's going to restrict the policy class. That's going to restrict the class of tapes that I can look over, which makes it a more compact, more efficient uh, way to solve your optimization, but potentially prevents you from achieving a, a, a perfect minima. Yep. So by, by virtue of saying that they satisfy Pontryagin's minimum principle, we know that that's only a local optima. This, is, this says that I can't make a small change in U to get better performance. Yep. Yeah. But it's only a, a necessary condition for optimality, not a sufficient one. But there's a bigger problem with it, with both of those. And that's the fact that they're completely useless in real life unless I do one more step, which is to stabilize the trajectories I get out. Okay. So finding some open loop trajectory um, by these methods, um, satisfying min Pontryagin's minimum principle, fine. But there's nothing um, in this process that says if I don't, if I change my initial conditions by epsilon, I could completely diverge when I follow, when I when I execute that open loop trajectory, right? If I change my simulation time step by a little bit, I might diverge. If I have modeling errors, I might diverge. Okay. So in order to make these useful for a real system, we have to do another step, which is trajectory stabilization. And it actually follows quite naturally from the things we've already talked about. Okay. So today we're going to give these guys teeth um, with a trajectory optimization. <coughs> I'll show you examples of a trajectory that's optimized beautifully for the pendulum even, 
And if I simulate it a little differently back, it just does the wrong thing. It never gets to the top. Okay, so we want to get rid of that um, problem. Okay, so the solution is, is to design a trajectory stabilization. Now, for those of you that, that have been playing with robots for many years, when you hear, hear trajectory stabilization, what do you think of? What kind of tricks do people use for trajectory stabilization? Sliding surfaces, that's, the, that's a good one for slow teen often will design a, a sliding surface and, and squish the error dynamics, right? Um, I mean, that's, that's actually pretty encompassing, I guess. That's what, uh, I think a lot of the trajectory um, stabilizers are based on sliding modes or feedback linearization in some form, okay? And all I'll say about it is that the story is sort of the same as everything we've said. If you have a fully actuated system, it's not hard to design a, a trajectory stabilizer. Okay, a good sliding mode controller could take advantage. Could could work uh, uh, even for an under-actuated system. But I think there's a. I prefer um, the linear quadratic form of these trajectory stabilizers. Okay, so um, we want to do a trajectory stabilization that's suitable for under-actuated systems, right? And the approach is going to be with LQR. Okay, so if we're going to use LQR, we better be able to linearize our system. So far when we've done the linearizations, um, we've only done them at fixed points. Okay, um, so the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what happens if we um, try to linearize at a more arbitrary point in state space? Yeah? So let's say I've got the system x dot is f of xu. And now I want to linearize around um, some x naught u naught, but not necessarily a carefully chosen x naught u naught, just something random in state space. The Taylor expansion of this says that this thing's going to be approximately f of x 0 u 0 partial f partial x evaluated x. Okay, and we called this before A and this B, and so that thing we can actually write as, in general, um, in the case where f of x not u not, if x not u not was a fixed point of the system, that, that term disappears. But, you know, be careful if you're doing your linearization out here, um, if you're at, not at a fixed point, if you have any velocity, for instance, then in the original x coordinates, um, it's not actually, a, the Taylor expansion doesn't give you a linear system. It gives you some affine system. This thing is harder to work with. Not incredibly harder, but harder to work with. Okay. So the trick is, the solution is quite simple, but I just wanted to, Say it the bad way first, so that so that you appreciate the good way, right? Um, if we change coordinates, and we use instead for our coordinates the difference between um, x 
10 x naught of t. Then x bar dot is going to be x dot minus x zero dot equals x dot minus f of x zero u zero, which is that c, right? This guy here is taken care of in this new coordinate system, which allows me to write the whole thing as x bar dot equals a of x bar you with me on that linearizing a system at a more arbitrary point well doing a Taylor expansion results in a linear system only if you change coordinates to lie on some system trajectory, okay? So x0, u0 um, must be a solution of, x, of f of xu of, my, of that equation, and then the system re reduces to, uh, to a linear system description, okay? But the, the cost you pay for this beautiful, simple, well, let me be even a little bit more careful. Okay, so um, A here, this partial F, partial X, is evaluated at X, T, U of T. And in general, A and B in this, when I do this, are functions of time, as well as X and T, okay? That's a pretty important point. Okay, so if I'm willing to change coordinates to, a long, to live along the trajectory, then the result is I can get this linear time varying model of the dynamics, yeah? Along feasible trajectories, system trajectories. The cost is that you have to work in a coordinate system that moves along your trajectory. Okay, so we'll see where that comes in in a little bit. But the first question is, okay, let's say I've got this linear time varying, um, time varying linear system. Can I do all the things I want to do with that? Right, that's actually, you know, in most of our control classes, we end up doing LTI systems. Um, LTV systems, linear time varying, Um, are actually a fantastically rich class of systems, okay, uh, that we don't talk about enough, I think, in life. They're still linear systems, right? They superposition still holds. So what is that? I mean, if I have, um, if I have initial condition um, one and some u trajectory one for t greater than equal to t zero, and that gives me some resulting x trajectory out for t greater than t0. And I have another solution, which is a different initial condition and a different control, right? And that gives me a different, I call this x1, x2 for t greater than or equal to t0. If I have that, then it better be the case that alpha 1 x1 of t0 plus alpha 2 x2 of t0 plus alpha 1 u1 tape plus alpha 2 u2 tape It's going to result in a trajectory which is alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2. 
that's superposition, right? That's the defining characteristic of linear, linearity. And even though this is a richer class of systems, these, these um, A of T, X of T, B of T, U of T, superposition still holds. And in fact, a lot of our derivations that we've done that are for linear systems still hold. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now the question is how do we design a, how do we work with the fact that this thing is still easy, you know, and design a, a controller that works with this new linearized system? First, I should break out my colored chalk and make sure we have intuition about this. Do you understand what this is doing if I do this time varying linearization? Let me, let me do an example on, with uh, the pendulum here, right? Our favorite theta, theta dot. And let's say we carve up, uh, we find some um, nice solution which gets me from my one fixed point to the other fixed point. Um, the ones that we were getting were these pump up trajectories which looked something like this, right? I'm moving through state space here and the dynamics here vary with state in a nonlinear way. Right? But if I have a trajectory, a feasible trajectory that goes through the, re the relevant parts of state space, then this time varying linearization takes my nonlinear system, right, and makes it parametrized only, instead of by being parametrized by, by state, it's going to make it parametrized only by time along the trajectory. Right? The trick is the trajectory. allows me to reparametrize my sort of nonlinearity in terms of time instead of state. And if I, it sounds like a simple thing when I'm just reparametrizing it, but it makes all the difference in the world if things are parametrized as a function of time and are otherwise linear, then I can do all kinds of computation on them. I can, I can integrate the equations. I can design re quadratic regulators on it. It makes all the difference in the world. OK. So, lo so what I'm effectively doing is coming up with local linear um, representations of the dynamics sort of along the trajectory. I'm not sure if this is a helpful way for me to, to draw it, but you can sort of think of this thing as approximating the dynamics along that trajectory, at every given instant in time, I'm going to use one of these sort of linear models. This is supposed to be some plane that you're driving through. I'm not sure if that's actually a helpful graphic, but it's the way I think of it. Okay. And by virtue of taking a particular path through, I can make locally linear models on which these things have, you know, eigenvectors and eigenvalues or whatever. Um, that are valid in the neighborhood of the trajectory. Okay, so if you can imagine, um, even without any stabilization, it could be that I, um, I could, I could quickly assess the uh, stability of my time-varying linear model, and trajectories in this linear model may converge to the nominal limit cycle, or they may diverge depending on a and b. Yeah, right, or they may blow up. This is by far the more common case, unfortunately. You'd be very lucky to come out of a shooting method or a direct collocation method and end up with a system where if you played it out, it just happened to be a stable trajectory. Um, okay, But we can assess all that 
quickly with these time varying linearizations, valid locally. Make sense? Yeah. So I, I think I missed some closing practices here. So we, we talk about that there isn't a bad way of doing this. This is not a bad way of doing this, right? When you were talking about it. If I try to linearize, if I do a Taylor expansion of my system um, in the original coordinate system, which is x, then it's not linear. End parentheses. That, that was the bad way to do it. Yeah? Good way to do it, change the coordinates to a, to a coordinate system which moves with the tra trajectory. If you do that, things become time varying linear. Good way, that was the good way to do it. And that's still an open parenthesis. We're still going. Yeah. Okay, so our task now is to design um, a time varying feedback controller. Since our model is time varying, you expect our solution to also be time varying, which takes these bad, unstable trajectories of the system, and they really are. I'll show you. You know, simple pendulum, this trajectory comes out, you change the, actually if you just integrate it in a different way, it'll go off and do the wrong thing. It typically doesn't go off and add energy to the system so much. The ones I get, I see, I'll show you are, are more, they diverge in the other way and end up just floating around here, for instance. Um, but they're not going to get you up here. Okay. So can we design a time varying stabilizer that, gets, that regulates that trajectory? Okay, I did actually do um, the original finite horizon LQR derivation on the board that day. Um, definitely won't write all that again, but let me say that uh, roughly nothing in that derivation breaks. I'm going to show you the important pieces. Nothing in that der derivation breaks, surprisingly, if A and B are now a function of time. Okay, so let's remember that. Um, the LQR derivation. Now I'm working with this x bar coordinate system. Okay. And I want to design a cost function to minimize here, which lives in this coordinate system again here. Let's say it's um, the final horizon times QF. Um, I've been trying to use t little f since my transposes look like the final horizon time otherwise. 0 to tf dt x bar again transpose q plus u bar r u Okay, in the original LQR derivation, we, uh, we guessed that the form, that the optimal policy had the form um, x bar s of t x bar. That's still intact. That's a, still a good assumption. This thing's linear, it's just in a different coordinate system. And we started cranking uh, through the, the sufficiency theorem, the, the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. And we found that our optimal feedback policy, our, first of all, our, our optimal cost to go, was described by this Riccati equation, which was negative S of t is Q minus S of T 
B, our inverse B transpose S of T plus S of T A plus A transpose S of T. And it turns out that with the, if you have a time varying A and B, that it's the exact same dynamics govern it. You just have your time dependence also in A and B. And that exact same Riccati equation works. And our final value condition was just QF. <coughs> and you can see from this, if, if, it, if it didn't make a difference for me when, um, when A and B became functions of time, it's pretty simple, although less interesting, I guess, to if Q were to be a function of time, no problem. If R is a function of time, no problem. Right? They still had to be, um, uh, they still have to be positive definite and symmetric. The, uh, oops, I did it the wrong way. Q can be zero, but R cannot be zero. Okay, so the LQR you know and love that you've used in MATLAB um, is the time um, invariant infinite horizon LQR, right? I told you that if you cared about a finite horizon and you had a time invariant linear system, then suddenly you had to, you couldn't just find the stationary points in this. Remember, MATLAB's solution just tells you the long-term behavior of S, okay? In the time, finite horizon time, even the LTI case, which is the um, A and B do not depend on time, the linear time invariant case, I still had to integrate back this Riccati equation in order to get my LQR controller. Okay? It's no more expensive to do the same thing in the linear time varying feedback case. Okay? And the resulting controller is um, U star is my nominal controller minus my R inverse B transpose S of T X bar. Right, these equations come up enough that I, you know, this is, these are pretty famous, pretty important equations, and so I, those I know off the top of my head, they come up all the time. <coughs> and this is the resulting uh, optimal trajectory, which is my nominal trajectory plus my feedback gain, which came out of my original LQR controller, if you remember that. Yes, good. So this, I should definitely put a T in under B. Thank you. And R, I haven't, I haven't written that case, but R could equally well be time dependent. Okay, so, some, so something big just happened, okay? Um, I can take a really, really complicated nonlinear system along some trajectory. If I find a good trajectory, um, then I can actually linearize that system along the trajectory and stabilize it. The thing I haven't convinced you of yet, because I, I only know how to do it from, from showing examples, but it really works well. Like I'm, it, so even though it's a linear system, um, it's a linear approximation of the nonlinear system, something like the acrobat or the cart pole swing up, it's got a huge basin of attraction. Lots and lots of initial conditions will find their way to the trajectory and get to the goal, right? If you want to do nonlinear control of a humanoid robot or something like this, um, this actually scales pretty nicely, right? I just have to solve this equation. S is the size, is, is, is a matrix that's number of state by number of state, but I could do that in 30 dimensions, that's no problem, right? 
And even for very nonlinear systems, local um, linear feedback works very, very well. So well, in fact, that I think that if you ask, um, and when I did ask sort of the LIDS guys, you know, Sasha Magretzky, he says, this is, this is definitely what I would do if I was controlling a walking robot or, or something like that. Okay? Um, we're trying to do the same thing to control neural, neurons in a dish now, right? We're trying to build good models of, of the dynamics, time varying models, for instance, and then doing this kind of control, yeah? It works really, really well, okay? The only complaint about it is that it's going to have, it's based on this linear, um, linear approximation, so it will have a finite basin of attraction. For some systems, it can be quite big. Um, if you have systems with hard nonlinearities, it won't be as big, right? Um, later in the course, I'll show you ways to explicitly reason about the size of those basins of attraction. But today, let's just say um, this is a good thing to know, good thing to have in your pocket. Let me show you it working. Try to convince you that it's, it's pretty, pretty good. <clears throat> Okay, so let's see where I've left myself here. I took this, um, the pendulum, let's do the shooting version. They both work fine, but let's do the shooting version. Um, is that bigger than I did last time? <laughs> That's pretty obnoxious. Maybe it's always been obnoxious. Can we get away with that? Yeah. You guys are like, I'm not blind. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I, did, I, sh I showed you last time the shooting code. It comes out with a resulting tape, um, X, T, and U, right? So it, it comes out after the result of these trajectory optimizers, whether it's shooting or whether it's um, uh, direct collocation, Whatever it is, it comes up with some open loop tape. I put X in there too, just to, as a, the reference trajectory that results. But what really matters is the, the time stamps and the U uh, command, the open loop tape. Okay, so let me, um, Save it this time. Okay, so it comes up with, in this case, with these parameters I've chosen, it comes up with some one pump policy. With the torque limits I have, the, the nurses I have, it comes up with a, a one pump policy that gets to me to the, to the top in four seconds. Okay. Let me now um, just simulate that a little bit differently. Um, okay, so the only thing I'm going to do ne here now is um, this control ODE is just a simulation which um, plays back exactly the the same open loop tape, but it plays it back with a little more careful integration. Because in the actual, in the shooting code I used, I used a big time step just so I don't waste time um, computing gradients to the nth degree of accuracy. That's not worthwhile. If I simulate the exact same thing back with a more careful ODE integration, let's see what happens. So that was that same trajectory that um, Exact same control inputs, just simulated more carefully. It, it made its honest effort to get up there, but it, it didn't quite get up there, turned around and came back down. Okay, and if you, I'm trying to show it also in this, uh, 
just this is the, the different state trajectories over time. You can see that the red and blue lines are the desired versus actual in, the, in theta in this case. And the, um, these two lines are the desired versus actual in theta dot. Um, they start off exactly on top of each other, but just little differences in the numerics cause them to go in different directions, yeah? Part ways. Okay, so now I've got this LTV LQR um, solution, which is exactly what I just showed you. And I'm going to put in, so I, I was just simulating it just now with just u being the nominal u. Now I'm going to add this, feed, this time varying feedback term, x minus x desired. And now my more careful integration results in a closed loop system which not only got to the goal but actually stayed up at the goal because I have a, um, you know, a stable system all the way to the top, okay? All right, so what I just said was, was very unimpressive. I said um, I computed an open loop um, policy with my methods from Thursday. I simulated them back. They didn't work, okay? But I then put a feedback controller on and from the exact same initial conditions, I now can simulate them and they work, right? Um, so it's sort of disappointing that we had to do that at all. Uh, but I can now, the stability is more than just sort of stabilizing the initial conditions. Let's add some fairly big random numbers to that initial condition and see what happens. It's, com it's recomputing the, um, the policy every time just because it was fast enough that I didn't bother to change it. Okay, so that actually started with pretty big different initial conditions. So, um, you know, theta was off by, uh, I don't know, two-tenths of a radian or something like this. The velocities were off by half a radian per second. Okay, we could crank that up a bit. It does a lot better than that. Um, but if you watch these things, they converge quite nicely to, together uh, at, at the end there. And what's, what matters is they get up to the top, right? So again, these things come together, find their way up to the top, and live, yeah? I bet if I put it, you know, a lot bigger, it'll still work. I normally do an order of magnitude, but let's not be silly. Oh, it didn't make it. <laughs> There's only one reason it didn't make it, actually. It's because uh, if you look in here, I'm actually honest about implementing the max torques. Yeah, so I actually have a torque limited. I impose it, and it, sort of, it lives on there. If I didn't, I bet I could, con I could convince you it works for any initial condition. But um, let's try it one more time. Get a little more lucky with the initial conditions. Oh, come on, come on. Yes, right? <laughs> okay, that was pretty far off and it still finds its way back to the trajectory. Good, yeah? Look at how big those initial conditions are, right? There and there versus where, wow, that's really good. Okay, I saw, did I see a question, no? All right, so this stuff works for pendulum. Uh, it works for more interesting systems too. I'll just show you the, um, the cart bowl real quick here. So you remember, I won't do the sort of, here's, here is what it looks like without feedback, I'll just do the, the initial conditions corrupted um, solution, pump up. Okay, so if you remember my solutions from last time, it never drove off the screen before, so that was actually it catching it by deviating enough that it came off the screen and then slowly coming back to the top, yeah? And uh, so that's, uh, this is, it must be its x uh, position or something going way off. No, not x position, what is that? That's my control, yeah. Did I do torque limits on that one? I still did torque limits. I just set them high, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, so it really works, okay? And the cool thing is, it's, I mean, the, the cost of implementing that LQR LTV stabilizer was negligibly more than implementing the, uh, the most of that time was the shooting optimization, right?
Yes. One question. Why, why do you always start at the like zero time? You could look at the initial conditions and look where is the closest point on my number of trajectory or something, and then do your control policy from that moment in time. Okay. So that's really, really good. Okay. That's exactly what I want to talk about next, actually. Um, okay. So I just marched, I designed a, a time varying feedback controller, right? It's negative K of T, uh, X bar of T, right? I designed that ahead of time. And then from the initial conditions, I started simulating from zero. And I just played out, you know, the, my nominal trajectory just marched forward with time. My feedback controller just marched forward with time, and my aerodynamics just marched forward with time. Okay, so before I explicitly address your question, let me point out, let me, let me ask um, even a simpler question here. All right, so what happened if I had plotted that in state space? What you would have seen is that the trajectory starts off somewhere in state space and comes together. That would have been a good idea. Maybe I should do that in a minute, but um, to sort of it comes together and finds its way onto that trajectory. Yeah? <clears throat> okay, so here's the question. What happens if I, instead of just changes in initial conditions, what happens if I have disturbances um, that push me off the trajectory? Well, that's okay. That's no different really than a um, different initial condition. They'll come back on here. What happens if I have a disturbance that pushes me along the trajectory with this controller? Let's say, you know, I've got sort of the, the helpful disturbance, which, you know, when I was right here, just happened to push me right to there. What's this control, what's my feedback controller going to do? Yeah, probably in a dramatic fashion, right? Um, you know, it's the same way it tries to quickly converge from here, it's going to try to get, it's going to push itself back towards that point, possibly. I mean, slowing down doesn't, makes it sound sort of no big deal. It might actually try to, I mean, it can't go backwards, but it might try to do something um, more severe, right, to try to catch up with that old trajectory, right? So the major limitation of this is that it's blindly, in order to have the strong convergence properties that we have, the controller is blindly marching forward in time, right? The great thing about Switching to a time parameterization is that I can compute everything. Everything's linear again. The bad thing is you're a slave to time. Okay, so um, Philip asked a nice question. He says, "So why not? Why do I just blindly start marching forward from time zero? Maybe if I have a, a controller, um, I should just look for the closest point in my trajectory, right? And then instead of indexing off time, index off some sort of." phase some, some f fraction of my trajectory and then execute that controller. And, you know, you can do that. I sort of I wish you the best if you do that. But my, sus my suspicion is that if on every DT you pick the closest point in the trajectory, then the result is you're going to chatter like you wouldn't believe. So there's a lot of protection you get when you, so this, you could think of this very much as a gain scheduled linear controller. Yeah, this is, this is a time varying gain scheduling. And the problem is if I switch gains quickly, then you're going to get chattering. Okay, so it, it might make a lot of sense, um, for instance, if you were to get a big disturbance to reevaluate and try to find the closest point and start executing that new policy with, with time re-indexed. Okay, but it's probably a bad idea in, in my experience to decide which part of the trajectory you're closest to on every, every time you implement the, every DT, sort of. That's probably a bad idea. <clears throat> yes? Um, could you maybe play some tricks if you had some idea of the basin of attraction of the current point you're trying to get to? And if you know that you're outside of it, then look around and see if there's a basin you are inside of it. Yes. So, um, so we're going to talk about, I, so I, I have a particular trick that, try to does, that does that in, um, we'll talk about it in the motion planning, but um, yeah, so, so Mark knows about these tricks for computing basins of attraction pretty efficiently, and um, 
So these days, what we do is we actually try to compute the funnel, the sort of the basin of attraction of this trajectory around, um, around the trajectory, and you could know discreetly if you left that basin of attraction. Right? So I'll give you the recipe for that, but, but it actually makes more sense, I think, in the, in the motion planning context, where we actually will design trajectories um, that fill the space with these basins. This is the very, very similar to the concept of flow tubes. The, yes. Okay. So, big idea turn my nonlinear system into a linear time varying system because I've parameterized, reparameterized it along the trajectory, do linear time varying control, and, you know, even really complicated systems that will work well. Right, we're trying to do it, we're doing it on our perching plane, we're doing it, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really a pretty good idea. Um, when I first started working with it, I, I thought that um, it would have the problem that, um, it would have the property that it uses a lot of control to force itself back to the trajectory and sort of rigidly follow the trajectory, right? It's easy to equate linear control with sort of high gain linear feedback, which people do a lot of, okay, but it doesn't necessarily need that property. If R is small in this derivation, it can actually take very subtle uh, approaches back to the trajectory. Your system might come in and sort of, you know, do whatever it needs to to get back on the trajectory with very little torque. The only price you pay is if your torque is smaller, if, you're, if, you're R, if you're penalizing torque use higher, then you might restrict your, that might short, shrink your basin of attraction. It might be that, that because it's trying to use less torque, um, it will not overcome the nonlinearities. Okay? But in the neighborhood of the trajectory, you can get these very elegant um, solutions, uh, which look like minimal energy kind of solutions for the nonlinear problem in the vicinity of these trajectories. Right? So one of the ideas we'll talk about later is how do you design the minimal set of trajectories, which if you use these um, controllers, which sort of do the right thing in a lot of places. If you walked away from this class knowing nothing but direct co-location and linear time varying feedback control, I bet you could control a lot of cool systems. Yeah? I guess you also have to know SysID, which I'm not going to tell you about. And that's the, that's the one that sort of, that's the gotcha, right? You have to have a model for all this stuff, right? But if, you, if you're willing, if someone gives you a model, or if you're willing to construct a model, then you can do a lot of things with this. With this. Okay, I want to give you one more um, mental um, picture to think about what this is doing so it sort of launches into the next um, thing here. So my cost to go function, which I just erased, is Remember, so my, my cost to go function, J of our x bar t, is x bar s of t x bar. Just like the original, um, this is a quadratic form, just like the original LQR, you can think of this as a quadratic bowl. In the LTI, LQR case, am I okay throwing around these three letter acronyms? In the LTI, LQR case, um, it was a, a static quadratic bowl centered around the point I'm trying to stabilize, right? So my cost to go. It said, it says, as I move away from the point I'm trying to regulate, I'm going to incur more cost in the direction, the sensitivity, the, you know, the, the, the rate it, it grows depends on the, 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 param the, the variables inside S, okay? Now in this picture, I have a, still a time varying, I have a time varying quadratic bowl but it's also moving through time because it's, um, it's, it's, it's very based on x bar, yeah? So in my pendulum world, if I have this sort of nominal trajectory, you can think of it as having some quadratic bowl here. And the, the, the LTI stabilizer that we did come up with, that was based on LQR, did have some sort of quadratic bowl shape that looked like that, okay? 
backwards in time, there's going to be another quadratic bowl. Can I sort of draw it very badly like this as maybe some, if I can just draw it coming off the, the board a little bit. So there's some quadratic bowl um, centered around this point, which is my cost to go at that point. If I march farther backwards in time, I've got some other quadratic bowl around this point. That sort of makes the point, again, that, that um, of the, if, you, if I were to get pushed, if my quadratic bowl is currently you know, this, because time is 5, or I had a 4 second trajectory, maybe time is 3 here. If I'm pushed along the trajectory, it's actually going to you know, incur just as much cost, roughly, as, I, as I'm pushed another direction. There's a quadratic bowl literally centered around x0 at time t. Right? That's what this equation says. And this quadratic bowl is the cost to go estimate, right? It says if I'm um, away from the trajectory, you know, I should expect the cost I incur in getting back towards the trajectory to be this quadratic form. Is that okay? And the key point is because I've reparametrized my um, equations in terms of x bar, this quadratic bowl always lives on that um, trajectory. Okay? The best thing to do, my cost function was x bar q x bar. My best thing to do is to drive x bar to zero, which means to drive my system back to the trajectory. People okay with that imagery? I don't, it doesn't look like they are. Everybody is okay. Well, are we okay with the LTI stabilizer being an LQR bowl, or a quadratic bowl? It says the farther I am away in the directions defined by S, I'm going to incur some cost getting back. This is just the same thing. It says if I'm at this point on the trajectory, right, I'm going to incur this cost to go. And the best thing to do, the minimal cost to go, is living right on that trajectory. As a consequence, the optimal controller, which tries to go down the landscape of the cost to go, is going to drive me back to the trajectory. Now I said all that because I'm about to do something that sounds totally wacky. Okay. What would, I, what would, it, would it ever make sense for me to design a slightly different cost function, which when I linearize and design the, the feedback controller, I end up with a cost to go over here. So let's say I, had a, let's say I, I have some nominal trajectory. I found through whatever method um, some reasonable system trajectory. But I really, I'm still not happy with that. The, the trajectory I really wanted was something like this. Let's say, would it make any sense to do my linearization around this trajectory and try to drive the system to this other trajectory? You mean like scaling your or, or optimal trajectory? I don't even mean scaling. It could, they could cross, they could do whatever. It's not a simple scaling. Let me give you a simple, simpler version of the problem. Let's say that um, say that again. Yes, I'm going to define a cost function which would have it so I prefer to live on that trajectory. Let me do it in the time invariant case just so it's, it's clear. So so let's say my coordinate system is back and simple, it lives around zero. So I have that cost function, or so that dynamics. And instead of my original cost function was just x transpose qx, let's say my cost function now 
is um, Let's think about this problem for a second. Okay? <clears throat> so let's say I have a linear system. Now the LQR controller we did initially, a little sloppy with that, but <clears throat> the LQR controller I did initially always assumed that the desired place you wanted to be in life was zero. Right? If the desired place you want to be in life is a constant, you know, it's three, let's say, then you can still do your fine, same old li li linear quadratic regulator, just move your coordinate system so the three is zero. Yeah? But let's say I, I've got a linear system, but I want to drive it through some trajectory, right? Time varying trajectory. X desired is a function of time. Okay, then I can't quite just re center the origin. I've got to think about how do I drive my linear system through some other trajectories. Okay? Now, the, the, it's actually, um, so LTI system, but my cost function is time varying because my, I have this desired trajectory that varies with time. The result, I won't write it down again, it's exactly, again, I can do this uh, uh, Riccati equation back up, right? The only difference is that the, the quadratic bowl is no longer going to be centered on the origin. The quadratic bowl is going to move with that desired trajectory. Okay? Yeah? If that's far away from where you linearized, could you... That's an so excellent question. So I'm going to, um, but this is a linear system. So first, we don't have to worry about that. But, that's, but don't let me forget to go back to that. Um, okay. So, so, right, so I can drive my linear system through some trajectory that's non-zero. Beautifully, with an LQR controller, the only problem is that my LQR controller has to have a, um, has a cost to go function and a controller, which is not pointing me always at the origin. You wouldn't want that, right? So in fact, the way it looks, there's a lot of ways that people derive it. With Pontryagin, it's not too hard to derive. Um, I prefer to derive it with the HJB. I'm not going to do the, the whole derivation, but I'm to bore you, but, but what you end up with is um, J of X of T has a form X transpose S of T X plus X transpose, I call this S2, S1 of T plus S0 of T. It's a full quadratic form. Right? When I just have this, it's, a, it's always a quadratic bowl, it's always centered around zero. If you want it in general to be a quadratic bowl that's not necessarily at zero, you need the full quadratic form. Right? And I could, e I could equal, equally well have written this as x minus x something, you know, desired s of t. But let's work with this form, yeah? So this is just an equation of a quadratic bowl, but not necessarily centered on, origin, on the origin, okay? And the LQR derivation gives me my backwards dynamics for S2. It gives me my backwards dynamics for S1 and for S0. And it's in the notes. It's actually already in your notes. If it's, if you've, it's in the HJB chapter that has been up there for a while. 
Okay? Now, um, the reason I'm on about all this is that there's another way. Um, I told you about shooting methods. I told you about direct co-location. There's yet another way that people like to design trajectories which use LQR you know, uh, directly. Okay? And that's this iterative LQR procedure. Okay. So let's say I have some um, trajectory that I've already found, x0 of t. And I have some different trajectory, which is my desired trajectory, x desired of t. Then using this optimal tracking, if you stick back in the time varying components, using this optimal tracking, I can linearize my dynamical system around that. So I, I have no guarantees that x desired is a feasible trajectory. In fact, in many cases, it's not. For instance, x desired might be be at the goal at all times, right? If I came up with a perfectly feasible x desired trajectory, I probably wouldn't be running uh, an open loop solver, right? Um, I want to get as I want to get as close as desired as possible to the x desired, um, while potentially minimizing cost and respecting the dynamics of the system. Yeah. So here's the way. To, here's one way to do it. Okay, linearize my system around my initial guess x zero of t. Then design a linear optimal tracking, linear time varying optimal tracking, which tries to regulate my system as close as possible to that trajectory. Now what Steven said was, was exactly on point. If I drive my system away from where I linearized, there's no guarantee that, that my linear model was going to be any good here. Okay? But the hope is that this method, this Trajectory is better, a better guess than the one before. Okay, and you iterate. Okay, make another approximation around there. Um, improve, you know, design the LQR controller, run the LQR controller that drives me here to find the new U tape. That design defines my new trajectory. Repeat. Okay, that's called iterative LQR. What else is it called, Wars? Do you know? Yeah? Do you see that? It's differential dynamic programming. Almost. There's a, there's a subtle difference, which I can tell you if you want. Um, there's a lot of names for it. People also call it, there's a, um, another guy, Bobro, some of you know Jim Bobro. He wrote this up called the sequential linear quadratic regulators. So you can, you know, any sort of four letter acronym that ends in LQR, if you put it in Google, you'll find something that's probably this idea. Yeah. If you put it in whatever arbitrary constant in front of it, you'll probably get this idea out. Um, <coughs> I mean, every iteration, you're trying to minimize your actuator cost. Right, but I mean, if you have a lot of iterations, potentially grow? I don't actually add to my old U-tape. I actually completely replace my old U-tape with a new controller, which, which drives me to the system. So there's no worries about additive sort of um, actions. Um, it actually tells me in my original nonlinear system what's my best guess at a, as a, as a U-tape that goes there. Yeah. Is 
So very, very good. So why would I want to do this? Why didn't I tell you about this first? Or why, you know, how does this compare to the other methods? Okay. There is a sense by which, and I, um, I thought about doing the whole derivation, but I think this is, I hope that this sort of short discussion is, is, is sufficient. Okay. So what I'm roughly doing is I'm using LQR to come up with a quadratic approximation of where my cost, where, where my minimum is. Okay. This is very much, this is very much in the spirit of those SQP methods, of the sequential quadratic methods. Okay. I'm using computation on this line to come up with a quadratic approximation of where I think the new minimum should be. Okay. So as such, it's a relatively cheap way Um, with sort of SQP properties, convergence properties. Okay. The the methods I told you about on Thursday, the backprop through time, the RTRL, um, they computed J over my trajectory. They computed partial j, partial alpha over my trajectory. They did not ever explicitly compute the second derivative. I never computed partial j, partial alpha, partial alpha, right? To explicitly do an SQP update, somebody needs to compute the Hessian of that, um, of that optimization. I'm relying on SNOPT to do some bookkeeping to estimate the Hessian to do the second order update. Okay, I would do better if I had an efficient way to compute the second derivatives, and I could hand that directly to SNOPT or whatever, and would get, would get expect faster convergence. Okay, this isn't quite the gradients that I want, but it has that feel to it, and it has similar convergence properties. So what you should think about is you should think about this as a more explicit second order method for making a large jump in my. Um, uh, in my trajectories with sequential quadratic sort of convergence results, yeah? I feel like I've lost everybody now, but uh, ask questions if you need to, yeah. Uh, the advantage of it is that uh, uh, it's fast. It could potentially require very few iterations to converge. One of the strong disadvantages is that there's no explicit way to do constraints. Right? It's, you have to think harder about how to do constraints in this. Okay? And I know less formal guarantees that it'll succeed, because it's an approximation of that quadratic. DDP actually, Elbor's, so, so the RL community uh, uses DDP a lot. And actually, a lot of people who do DDP do iterative LQR. For instance, for instance, Peter Beal and those guys, they always call it DDP. They're actually doing iterative LQR. DDP explicitly um, actually has you have to do a second order expansion of your, um, of your dynamics. So you don't just get A of T, X, you actually do go to second order expansion of your dynamics, right? So it's a little bit more expensive of an update, um, but most people sort of equate it almost exactly to iterative LQR. So this X not trajectory, mm -hmm. this, this isn't a trajectory that you found by doing RTRL or something like that. This is something different? So good. So this could be a stand-in replacement to RTRL. I could start with a random x not trajectory. So, so maybe it's better to start with a random u, u trajectory, simulate it, and get an x not trajectory. And then it will quickly reshape until it gets as close as possible to this x desired trajectory. But you're reshaping your control actions that will get you to the x trajectory. Yes. So I'm reshaping u, re-simulating to get the new x. Yeah. I wrote it more carefully in the notes, and but, but I hope this is the, the right level to do the class. Okay. Um, and there's one extra thing that I would, that, so I say you ha this works if you have a desired x, desired trajectory, which means your cost function has this sort of a form. Okay. But the people, the advocates of iterative LQR and, and DDP say that every cost function has this form. This is just a tailor, second order Taylor expansion of whatever nonlinear cost function you, you want. Okay? 
So write down whatever nonlinear cost function you have, do a second order expansion on it, and you end up with a quadratic cost function like this. And you can then approximate that solution with an iterative LQR scheme. Or RTRL or background through time. This is just a, this is the third out of our list of methods. And I just want to, my goal is only to know so that you know that it exists and you can read the notes if you want more and and uh, you can read the papers if you want more. Okay. Yeah, Michael. So I think that I asked something similar, but like you're penalizing the deviation from your nominal control input. So what if you're like as you iterate, your control input keeps growing, but your you still Good. So, so um, I'm also I'm, I'm actually the the total cost is actually the cost with respect to some nom, some some you desired. Okay. So I end up trying to optimize that in a in a coordinate system based on you not, but the cost I'm trying to minimize is the the u in the original coordinate system minus u desired, which in a lot of cases is zero, right? So I actually end up, although I do it in a weird coordinate system. And it, it actually sort of eventually subtracts itself out because I add it back in at the end. And you, it's quite easy to, to, for instance, minimize u squared in the original coordinate system. Okay? So on Thursday, we get to do walking robots. We're going to move on to the next uh, major thing. But you've now learned um, three of the, the, of the uh, sort of open loop trajectory optimizers that people really use. Iterative LQR very quickly, RTRL um, back route through time, I grouped as one, the shooting methods, and direct co-location. Okay. There's another one that, that's recent addition to the scene, which is this discrete mechanics and optimal control, this DMOC. If anybody was excited about that and wanted to do a class project on that, that would be a perfect sort of thing. Grab that paper, show, show us that it works on the Acrobat card poll. That'd be beautiful. I'd love to sort of have that. Um, have, have us try, uh, try that and, and see how it compares to the, uh, the other methods. Um, you've got a pretty good toolkit for, for optimal control now, practical optimal control, okay? Um, and it works for flying robots, but it also works for your wheeled robots if you want to control them, uh, you know, with better control. Uh, you know, PD controller could be, you could do a drop-in replacement LTI um, optimal tracking controller, and it would, it would be better, if, assuming your model's better, okay? So you, you now have these, these tools. Um, quick procedural things, I know we're out of time. Um, so next Thursday, well, so let me say the good thing first. In two weeks, you're on spring break, <laughs> yeah? Uh, the Thursday f preceding that is our midterm, okay? Um, so we're gonna try, we haven't had a midterm in the class before, so there's no old exams for me to give you, but, but John and I are going to try to come up with some, um, some representative problems for you to take home for Thursday of this week. Yeah, so you can have some, some problems to munch on um, over the weekend. It'll be an in-class exam um, Thursday before spring break, which is a week from Thursday. Okay. Um, yes, so open book, uh, well, I mean, you can, grab, you can grab whatever notes, open note exam. Uh, Absolutely. And, well, I'll, I'll say it more in the preparation package, but, but roughly we're going to, uh, I think if you have your notes with you, if you've done the problem set, and most importantly, if you know how these algorithms, where the algorithms sort of relate to each other and where they would be used in different systems, I can guarantee I'm going to ask you something about that, then, um, then it, it's, not gonna, it's not designed to be a killer. Um, good. And, and I hope you start thinking about projects we're going to ask. I decided that I wasn't going to, um, just out of sort of being a fairly nice person, I wasn't going to ask you to do projects before your midterm, right? Um, but this time last year, I was asking people to submit project uh, sort of um, proposals. We're going to do that sort of immediately after the midterm. If you've been chewing on, on, you know, this method looked like a really good match to my research problem or you know, I've never actually, you know, thought about juggling robots before or something like this. You can imagine, um, so, so in the fairly new future, we're going to ask you for a, a half-page uh, project proposal uh, that we can iterate with you on to, to get going on a, on a world-class final project, yeah? <coughs> See you Thursday.